Hello and welcome to Let's Talk SOC, a podcast series brought to you by SecureWorks, a leader in cybersecurity, focused on empowering security and IT teams worldwide to better prevent, detect and respond to cyber threats. I'm Professor Sally Eves, your host. Hi, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Let's Talk Sock. I'm your host, Sally Eves, and today we're looking back, really, to go forward as we explore the key developments in cybersecurity in 2023 to better prepare for 2024. And to do exactly that, I'm delighted to be joined now by Ken Dietz, who is CISO at SecureWorks. Welcome, Ken. Hi, happy to be here. Oh, fantastic to see you again, Ken. And perhaps to start, perhaps to share a little bit about yourself and your role at SecureWorks. Sure. So I am the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for SecureWorks, and I am in charge of uh, our products, both our product security for our Tages platform that we deliver security services to our customers on, and our corporate security. So making sure that our employees are being as safe as possible with the data that our customers are entrusting us with. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Love that holistic focus. And I almost don't know where to start in terms of what has happened to cybersecurity in 2023. Could take so many approaches here, but maybe your kind of gold, silver and bronze, if I may. What's your biggest moments that we should be reflecting on now to go forward into 2024? It's been a very, very busy year. Uh, Some of the the big things that have uh, uh, emerged this year is obviously the emergence of AI, uh, generative AI uh, that that have... uh, uh, taken uh, kind of the industries by storm. There's been some big breaches uh, around uh, identity providers like uh, Okta was a, was a fairly big and ongoing breach that's impacting um, more companies as, as more uh, information comes out. The MGM Grand uh, breach was, uh, was a fairly big and uh, newsworthy event and, and shows the importance of uh, employee training and, 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 um, all the vulnerable areas of where we interact with uh, with our users, um, as well as uh, new regulations in uh, from in the U.S. at least from from the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, publishing new rules around uh, reporting of cybersecurity events and disclosure of uh, cybersecurity risk management practices, uh, as well as the uh, SEC getting more aggressive around enforcement. They uh, uh, have filed a suit um, against uh, the CISO uh, of SolarWinds, which I believe is a first um, uh, for this type of action. Absolutely. I'll definitely come back to that, if I may, uh, Ken, a little bit later as well. The MGM one, funny enough, there very, very recently, I think that was Scattered Spider, the casino incident there. And I think that's a great example, too, of another area we're seeing in terms of this evolution into networks in so many different ways, almost kind of OCG, or Organized Crime Group in approach, very highly adaptive and organized. Um, but equally, we've got the other approach where we've got kind of smaller, less organized entities as well that are also collaborating on some of the dark marketplaces and forums too. So such a kind of ecosystem approach in many different ways, but also this diversity and variety of threats that we're seeing and also kind of actors collaborating together too. We're seeing a lot of examples of that and reimagining old threats as well. But I love what you said there about AI, obviously at the fore and so many discussions at the moment, it is kind of this juxtaposition in many ways, isn't it? Opportunity and threat can support in so many ways for proactive threat intelligence, but can be weaponized in, in many ways as well. So, so much to talk about there, but I love those examples thank you and obviously the impact of this is is multifold and and, and depending on which example we draw on but overall how would you say this kind of collection of different types of incidents is impacting now on cybersecurity strategy as we look forward uh it's it's definitely having uh an impact obviously from the ai perspective uh uh, learning new risk management uh, uh techniques for how you're going to employ these but not only that but thinking about how you're going to manage the risk for AI that you're going to subscribe to. So, you know, is this what what sort of environment are you operating in? What sort of information are you providing to the AI? What sort of information are you relying on the AI to give you? All those are areas of risk that, that got to be um, managed. And, and, and there's going to be a lot of learning as we're going uh, through throughout the next year or so around those risks. Um, uh, both from an accuracy, making sure the AI is providing the right data to you, that it's accurate, not hallucinating, 
um, and also that it's protecting the private data, uh, all the privacy concerns that we normally have, making sure that none of that, that private data is leaking out to other AI users. Um, uh, all these are kind of challenges. Uh, uh, and, and that doesn't even take into account some of the other safety factors where people are worrying um, what sort of decisions are you going to have the AI making? What sort of automation are you going to build into that? Those are a whole nother set of kind of policy concerns uh, around what we want AI to do. Um, whereas for CISOs, they're probably going to be focused a lot around the data management and, and the data protection. Uh, and then, of course, the breaches uh, continue uh, uh, at a pace. And there is uh, no doubt that there is a global ecosystem uh, of criminal providers out there that are providing tools and capabilities to anybody that wants to do crime on the Internet. Uh, and, and they are having varying levels of success. Uh, and some of those are very big and very no noteworthy. Some of those are, are pretty small, uh, but it's still a healthy ecosystem. And there's still a lot of bad actors out there wanting to do crime. Exactly. And the cost of entry um, for those types of dark services, should we say, has gone yeah, down so well. much as well, hasn't it? You know, like a ransomware kit. It's almost like you, you go for your regular coffee house, you know, five times a week or something. Equivalent price of five coffees. You could have that kind of base entry type of kit. It it really is quite staggering. So, yes, so many different areas there. And I think the other implication, just as you were speaking there, is about skills as well. Again, we talk about shared responsibility, don't we, in terms of cybersecurity. But again, ensuring that we're doing that in the right way in terms of skills uplift and more focus on kind of experiential hands-on learning and that simulation exercises, I think, are so, so important. Um, and also just like awareness around these topic areas because generative AI, I think sometimes it's kind of simultaneous with, say, just chat GPT, but there's so many different flavors. And, and obviously traditional AI in many cases is actually a tradition, you know, very complementary, but actually more appropriate in certain ways. So, so the education about when to use these technologies and, and how and why, I think is so critical too. So again, so much to dive into, isn't it? But you also mentioned earlier on all things really to do with legislation and compliance. And you mentioned the SEC rulings. I'd love to dive into that a little bit more as well, because I think everything around compliance is just growing in terms of prominence, but also a challenge area, you know, with some of the geographical differences is just one example. So what are you seeing here in terms of the impact here, not just on transparency, but on you know, requirements of the board and individual members? And kind of what impact do you see next in this regard? Yeah, so it is very clear that the SEC is, uh, it, for U.S. regulated entities, is trying to drive more transparency. That's what these rules are aimed at. There's really two big components to the rules. Uh, one is um, your annual disclosure, what we call a 10K form, including in that disclosure more information about how the company is managing cybersecurity risk and who in the company is responsible for that and how the board plays a governance role in that. That is information that the SEC thinks investors need to have, so they want to see it in that annual disclosure. So there's going to be some changes with, with public companies in their annual disclosures, talking a lot more about their cybersecurity risk program, uh, and that's going to have a, a pretty big impact because that's not normally something that, that companies talk about uh, as publicly, but it is starting to happen more, and I think this is going to drive it even farther in that direction. And then the second part to the new rule is disclosing cybersecurity incidents, material cybersecurity incidents. So using traditional materiality um, calculations that the SEC has built up over the years for determining what's material and what's not material to a company, they want you to apply those uh, kind of findings to individual cybersecurity incidents and determine if it requires a public disclosure. And if it does, they expect you to file that within four days of, of that determination. Um, and, and that's a public disclosure that they're looking for, an 8K filing that goes to everybody, to investors, potential customers, everybody. Um, so, so it'll be interesting to see how the industry responds, how people determine materiality, and how, many incident, how much more incident disclosure we actually see um, from these companies and, and how that impacts uh, the reputation of the companies, both for investors and for their customers. Uh, it, it's going to be a very interesting time. Uh, and, and I anticipate that we're going to see more kind of targeted court cases from the SEC to um, uh, before the industry really figures out 
where they want to uh, narrow in on those disclosures. I think the SEC is uh, going to be trying to make some uh, some some examples uh, uh, based upon any incidents that are not reported that they think are material. I, I, you can definitely see that coming down the line. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that, that really is in the pipeline, isn't it? You're making me think there as well. You know, from a European perspective, say from the European Union legislation as well, we've got NIST 2. And I think it's 17th of October, 24, that has to be transposed into national laws across the European Union. And that has much bigger, wider you know, obligations for cybersecurity right across new sectors. So, for example, across energy, uh, transport, health, digital infrastructure, I think many more as well. Um, but that scope has expanded. But equally, what you were saying about reporting obligations, that has expanded massively too. And again, the timelines and what's in scope of that. So really interesting synergies there. And of course, NIS2, although Although it's a European Union legislation, lots of implications globally as well, because from a supply chain perspective, you know, if you're in the US and you're, you know, again, supporting an organization that is in scope, you will be too in many different ways. So, again, hugely significant there. So across the board, I think this onus on reporting. Yeah, and I think that's important with, with cybersecurity. We are a globally interconnected economy, especially for these larger businesses. So all these regulations are, are have a cumulative effect and, and have to be managed. Um, uh, obviously, the EU has led the way kind of with privacy and the, the GDPR, and, and it's going to continue to evolve its legislation in those directions. In the U.S., really national level legislation has, has really been around things like the SEC and this type of disclosure enforcement, but states have, have built out pretty robust privacy uh, framework similar to the GDPR that companies are are complying to, but there really hasn't been a national level one for all states. So so it really depends on on where you're doing business and where your customers are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great points there. And kind of putting these all together, this collective impact of regulation. And we haven't even mentioned you know, other areas as well, like ESG, for example. Again, another acceleration area in terms of compliance and again with geographical differences. So you can see this mountain and mountain, can't you? So how do you see this affecting kind of boardroom dynamics, particularly with some of the more, say, personal liabilities some of this legislation puts into place too? But equally, perhaps changing the narrative, how can all of this be more of an opportunity? For people in roles like yourself, uh, well, it could be more opportunity. It, I anticipate that boards are going to seek out more cybersecurity expertise. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a um, a bunch of CISOs like myself are going to get board positions. Um, that most CISOs probably are not ready for a board position or don't have the executive experience or the executive presence for a board position, but. But however, bringing them on as an independent advisor to a board member or seeking out um, executive board members that have experience running cybersecurity companies. Those are the types of things I would expect to see more on, on boards, something where they can focus on cybersecurity and show to their investors, to their customers, to the regulators that they're taking it seriously uh, and that they are seeking out this expertise and that they're seeking to build their expertise and in cybersecurity risk management that include training to the board, um, more opportunities for CISOs like me to interact with their board to make sure you're bringing them up to speed and giving them the tools they need to govern the risk areas that, that you're managing. Fantastic, Ken. I love that. I know we're out of time now. And again, such a pick and mix of areas we could have gone into here in terms of looking back to go forward. But I really appreciate your time. And for me, I love the fact that we not just talked about kind of the technology that's being used both proactively and, and kind of against us in terms of cybersecurity, but such a focus here on the human factors too and around culture and around agency within roles and around skill development as well. I think that's so, so important. It really is that holistic focus that makes such a difference. Ken, thanks so much for joining us on Let's Talk Sock today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. It was uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching and listening too. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thank you very much.